Hey, everybody, and welcome to the Backcountry Hunters and Anglers podcast and Blast Live. Um, I have driven down to the big snowy city of Missoula, and uh, I have with me tonight, um, we had a longer intro for um, Mr. Paul Hesburgh, but um, I wanna, I'm want i going to just say that uh, Paul is a, land, a research landscape ecologist for the U.S. Forest Service. And he has worked with wildfire and fire ecology for decades and decades now. I'm super proud to get this guest. I'm super proud to be here with Paul tonight, virtually. Um, we have so much to talk about um, in the, I think fire is front and center on most people who are hunting in the West. Fire is front and center in the East right now as part of restoration ecology. But we're gonna focus on the West and these mega fires and what we can do in the future. Um, where do we go from here, given that fire is a part of our lives now, whether we like it or not. Um, we're gonna run through some history, um, but if you would with me, uh, welcome uh, Paul Hesburgh, a research landscape ecologist with the US Forest Service. Uh, he's in Wenatchee, Washington, and he has been all over the West Study and fire and fire ecology. Paul, good to hear you, man. Thank you. Hey, thanks for having me, Hal. It's good to be here. I'm, uh, for as we start out here, uh, I wanted to get uh, a, a kind of give people an idea of who you are and what a, a research landscape ecologist does and how you spent your career. Um, could you fill us in just a little bit? You bet. Uh, my audio coming in okay? Yeah, you sound great. All right, right on. I'd like so, to know uh, how you got into this in the first place. Um, oh man, a lot of <laughs> a lot of side steps. Um, I started out as uh, I started out as a Boy Scout when scouting was still cool, uh, and that ages me. Um, I went through and made it to Eagle Scout, and I fell in love with the woods. It was my safe place, and uh, I, uh, I started out in pre-med. My folks thought I'd make a good physician, and partway through, I realized I couldn't imagine myself in a white coat for the rest of my life. So I, I put a pin in it and went back to forestry school and uh, wow. completed a degree in forestry, went on to grad school and got a doctorate in forest Oregon State University. I moved out west uh, 43 years ago, and I never went home. And... Uh, I started out studying forest insects and diseases and how they uh, how they uh, affect the forest, basically, you know, uh, what makes a tree susceptible, what makes a stand of trees or a landscape susceptible. And I started thinking about that. I realized that these were processes that were influenced by the conditions that were in front of them. And so I started building models of how forest conditions influence how mistletoes affect the forest or a bark beetle outbreak can occur or not occur. And um, I took a sideways move into looking at wildfires because I thought, well, they're another process just like this. And so uh, I retooled over the next decades uh, as a landscape ecologist, which basically means I study how big patterns of forest structure and composition influence processes like wildfire behavior or how bark beetles or foliators move through the forest. And uh, and I found a home there. I just, I love the work I do. I passed my retirement age and I, I pretty much don't know how to retire, so. Well, you were, um, you were just making, you're, you're in the Bitterroot cell lane when I was talking to you. That was your latest long-term trip, right? Yeah, we did, uh, we did uh, a month long hitches in 2017 and 18 in the Selway Bitterroot doing research in the white cap drainage. And then uh, we capped off the second trip with a couple of weeks into Bob Marshall um, going up the dry fork of the Blackfoot. Gotcha. Well, yeah. Out of Lincoln. Oh, yeah. No, no. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What were you looking at up the dry fork? Our research in the wilderness areas, if you think about a wilderness area, it's a, it's a really cool classroom because we're starting to allow wildfires to do their stuff. We're allowing wildfires to overlap. And we had some funding to look at the effect of reburning 
And reburning is kind of a new idea in the fire community, and it's, it's a really simple idea. We've done some modeling to show that over uh, centuries, the forest didn't just burn, it reburned. What that basically means is the mosaic of forest structure and composition emerges from patterns of fire on fire interactions and the time since fire. And the reason why this is a super cool idea is because if you have uh, fires burning previously burnt areas, when the, the wood falls down from the previous fire event, it gets consumed by the second fire. And so how that new forest grows up and its vulnerability to the subsequent fires really changes as a consequence of reburning. So it ends up being kind of a cool idea to sort of throw into the mix as we think about how to bring fire back and how to bring in these positive effects of reburning back to the landscape. So essentially, if you decouple that dead wood from the new forest that's growing up, it's much harder to burn it. How extensive was that? What effect did that have? Those are the things we're looking at. Wow. I, had, um, I was a kind of a commercial morel picker after the 2000 fires in the Bitterroot. Yeah. And um, that, I think we saw every kind of permutation of where what fire can do, like intensity and places where the, the earth itself was almost burned to the point where you would fall down. You couldn't, it wouldn't hold together. Yeah. Bitten like. Um, and, uh, that, that was a huge education for me. You know, um, I had never been, I'd never spent that. We spent probably six weeks doing that. Yeah. Up. And, um, I just, uh, I was wondering, so you were telling me earlier of a, a horse kind of horse wreck where a guy got his head stobbed up the West Fork of the Sun River. Yeah. And I was wondering, um, and y'all brought him back to my town and got him sewed up by a vet. Um, right, and in, in the middle, of the night, no less. But uh, I, was that before all of that burned? Because that's uh, really, yeah, okay. Yeah, that country didn't have any burn scars on it at that time. This was quite some years ago. Gotcha. Well, it is. It is so jack strong now. You know how the wind is in there, right? Um, it is. It is jack strong like a like pickup sticks for miles in there now. And, um, we were just talking about what a reburn would look like in there, um, literally just a couple of weeks ago with a packer friend of mine. Yeah, don't you uh, don't you feel sorry for the trail crews that have to recut out those main lines every year? I did. My son did it. <laughs> <laughs> he was on. Yeah, it's, it's harsh work. Yeah, and it's really it is completely. I mean, every wind. It'll actually it'll seal you in there. You have to go in with full on silky saws and cross cuts and everything, or else right. it's coming back. <laughs> yeah, it's like that in the, up the dry fork too. Uh huh. It's burned out pretty bad. Well, let's talk a little bit about. Um, so you've kind of your career has kind of paralleled the reemergence of the mega fire. Would mm -hmm. you? Think that was true. Um, I think that. Uh, I think mega fires are something that emerged since uh, since the the climate revved up in the mid '80s, and uh, but it it didn't have any intersection with really with the work we were doing. We were we were trying to understand the big landscape ecology of fire. Basically, um, how did the landscape work 200 years ago? How's it shifted? What does that do to fire behavior? Stuff like that. It, it kind of, our kind of work and that from other colleagues of mine, it kind of uh, made the center stage and there was more funding once we started seeing these big fires uh, come on, you know, and then they were asking, what can we do about it? And so we looked back at the historical landscape to see how they worked, uh, you know, before we excluded fire. And um, so now there's some really nice linkages, but uh, there's nothing planned. It was very fortuitous, right? Sure. Well, I was looking at some of your photographs, um, especially on the TED Talk, which um, yeah. I, I would recommend anybody that's watching this to come and, and check that out, too. But um, you have the big photographs of, of landscapes, say, in 1900 or even earlier, right? Um, where the mosaic in the grasslands and all are, are they predominate in what are now dense forests. Can you talk about that a little bit? You bet. Um... So one of the things, you know, when you do research, you'll develop sort of statistical results and you can tell a science story, which is really important to other scientists. But if you're going to try to communicate to 
uh, people who just love forests and love being out in them. Uh, uh, photographs are the way to really tell that story. And so um, uh, photograph, uh, I stumbled on Osborne panoramas back in the, the you know, probably the 1990s. Um, in 1930s, William Osborne had a, a bunch of uh, salty dudes go with him on horseback to high mountain peaks in the West and they photographed these big 120 degree panoramas in black and white with these great big box cameras, you know? And so this colleague of mine, John Marshall uh, and I started to get a mind to say, well, what would happen if we re-photographed those from the same vantage point? Would we see a lot of similarity or a lot of difference? And it was jaw dropping how much a difference. And we started thinking, you know, this is a really great way to help tell the story of change by looking at all sorts of dry pine and you know wet forests and cold high elevation forests and uh, alpine heathlands and just to told, tell the whole story of you know encroachment and density increase and so that's how we got into that. It's just better storytelling, really. Yeah. Was it was it shocking to you how different it was? It's incredibly shocking. It's it's so amazing how. The world we think we live in has been transformed in 100, 150 years. The forests of the West look nothing like the forests we inherited when we established the forest reserves in 1905. Right. They don't bear any resemblance. And it, it takes a photograph to nudge you and have that, oh my God moment, right? Yeah. And so tell me, so part of this, of course, is fire exclusion, which, which we did after 1910, right? The big burn. Yeah. And, and then, um, you know, I'm going to get into this a little bit later, but um, you, you wrote me something that was so interesting was how when you have that many stems, that many trees coming into a watershed. Yeah. And, and we talk about the, the 1905 forest reserves were, were to protect watershed. Mm -hmm. But when you have that many stems per acre, you are taking so much volume of water out of the earth. Right. Um, so you've actually changed the entire nature of the watershed as well. Um, you've had, yeah, the, if you think about it, trees are pumps, right? And the reason they're pumps is because uh, transpiration, water uptake from the roots to the stem to the leaves, uh, uh, it allows for water and nutrients to be supplied to the foliage, but it, to make um, pho photosynthesis which then makes wood and more leaves and things like that. But if you stop and think about it, these pumps, the more trees you have, the more leaf area you have, and the more leaf area you have, the more transpiration and evaporation that takes place. And so when you have this hot, dry, and windy weather, you're literally dewatering the landscape more significantly. Now imagine that some forest areas have 10 to 100 times more trees than they did 100 years ago. So the question is right now, uh, in a lot of places where water scarcity and late season flows for fish, native fish, right, it's an issue. A lot of the questions are right now is how much water has been pumped up. And if we were bringing something back uh, like the open conditions on the drier aspects and much less uh, dense forest where that really makes sense with the topography, what would that look like in the water signal? Um, We've learned that there's a really cool relationship between snow and tree cover. If you have continuous tree cover, the tree tops capture the snow and the losses through sublimation or freeze drying back to the atmosphere are really high. But you space them out one or two crown width and more snow gets to the ground, the tree cover shades that snowpack and so it melts later. The runoff is slower. And so the question is can we produce a late signal, a late season? signal in flows that matters in the creeks and cribs for fish. And as it turns out, an awful lot of studies are turning up that there's significant water to, to uh, be produced and made available as a consequence of some restorative treatments for forests that have a side benefit for streams. Well, uh, it's hard. And I, I spent a long time, you know, doing white bark work. Yeah. The, the white bark, is, they are spaced out, of course. There's not a canopy of white bark. And um, they do, in the bottle brush shape, they do hold snow and everything slows down. They shade back and then they keep they running. From happening. Um, so, so to go back a little bit, the, the condition of the forest, which you've called an epidemic of trees, um, 
in in one of your talks was um this condition is anthropogenic right it's 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 exclusion and climate change and and i mean we've kind of created this density of forest which is now working against us as a tinderbox for megafire we really did none of it's intentional it's a it's an unplanned sequence of things that has a result we don't like um but it even goes back further than fire suppression days right um if you stop and think about it uh in western north america uh native american tribes had been living on the landscape for ten thousand years and there's some really cool papers now that show us that they were master burners they they uh if you think about it dense forest is the enemy of food production right and so they'd thin out the forest to get the right lighting conditions and so forth on their on the berry crops to to uh, refresh the berries so the picking was good and so they were the shrubs were in good condition um uh, they collected bear grass which grows in openings and they had literally hundreds of uses of fire now imagine they're marshaled onto reservations by the mid 1800s so all of this indigenous burning which is actually really highly skilled cultural burning okay that's yeah, literally what the trees i was looking for it's cultural burning i got from you yeah it's called cultural burning so that's that really starts and then you start seeing uh cattle and sheep well nobody nobody was trying to put out fires by grazing cattle and sheep they saw these amazing ranges and so they put critters on them and but it had the effect of influencing fire in a big way because the grasslands were conveyor belts for fire when you got two three inch stubble height you don't have a good conveyor belt and so so really vast grasslands uh, were no longer spreading fire and they were the conduit for a lot of fire now you add uh, railroads and roads which they didn't plan as fire breaks but they're working like that and you start really keeping fire out of more and more of that landscape, right? <laughs> now you add fire exclusion on top of that by uh, fire suppression, which gets really effective in the middle 30s. For 50 years, we kept almost all the fires out. You really are allowing an awful lot of trees, seeds to rain down, trees to establish, regenerate, and then get their growth, right? Mm -hmm. And so, um and we'll talk about solutions to this in a little while, but uh, um, so one one effect of being a human being is when you the way we see landscape at our time is the way we think it should be, you know. Right. Um, and, I, and I know this from like um, working in southern Idaho, where the sagebrush has all been incinerated, and it's right. like grass Medusa head landscape. People and yet people who move there see that as a beautiful the Bennett Hills, you know. They didn't see the the old sagebrush ecosystem. So do you have do you find that you're pushing the stone up a little and trying to remind people that a mosaic landscape is healthier than a forest? Um I you broke up a little bit there. Um is the gist of it do I find it hard? Uh, teaching people about the importance of Apache landscape? Yes. Yeah, you bet, because um, you know what you know, right? And you you know what you love and you know what you see. And so it's, it's one of the reasons why we use the then and now photographs to show the change and then try to link those prior conditions to really positive effects on um, habitat conditions and their networking. Um, how fire can be a really positive influence if we allow it in the right way back in the landscape. A way to think about it is fire is coming inevitably to a landscape near you. How do you want it to come? Right. Do you want it meted out in clever doses or do you want it belching in, in unbridled hot fires that, you know, lay in smoke for a month? Uh, so, so, so to me, it's, showing the value of that patchwork, connecting it to habitats, showing the relationship of good fire to that landscape, how good fire creates those patterns and maintains them, and then how can we invite good fire back into that that has a lot less smoke, less human health effects, better on habitats, stuff like that. Right, and I you know you, you've discussed actually herding fire, you know, as if, as if fire were a herd of, a herd of, of livestock. Um, but, uh, when before we get to that, um, one of the critical 
issues here is that that Dr. Stephen Pine had called this the age of the piracy, you know, the age of right. the fire, because partially that where we put to. And partially also it's anthropogenic climate change, right? That is that is making this more critical yet. Yes. Talk about just a little bit what you've seen. You bet. Um, so the, the changes to the forest landscape are human caused and the changes to the climate are clearly human caused. There's little debate about that in the scientific literature. And in fact, globally in every fire prone ecosystem, this is really clearly understood. There's very low uncertainty about this. And if you stop and think about it, um, there's, there's, there's parts to the climate story that are difficult to change, but there are other parts where we are, where it's vulnerable to change. And so that story, unpacking that is an important thing. We now know from the last 30, 40 years of research that uh, going back millennia, uh, uh, hot, dry climate years with or or pr protracted droughts were responsible for big area burned where you had the ignitions. We go back thousands of years and we can see that in the record, whether you're looking at uh, charcoal in polar ice that you drill down to or uh, charcoal deposits in varv sediments in ponds and fens, things like that. So we can see, we can go back pretty deep and understand that it's always been the case. And with the climate warming, the concern is that, uh, well, I'll give, you a, I'll give you the number, which is I think quite fairly shocking. In the, last, uh, in the last 20 years, that area that's burned, it's probably burning seven to 8 million acres of the West per year on average, some are over 10 or 11 million acres. That area will triple between now and the next 30 years with the current warming trajectory of the climate. That's a big deal. So what we see in the West, is the best version we could possibly imagine of the future. And it will not occur like that because of the current warming trends. But, but the fuel conditions, the fire severity is driven by the fuel conditions. That's how much dead wood on the ground, how dense the trees are, and whether or not you got fuel ladders, seedlings, saplings, poles, that'll convert, convey the flames from the forest floor up into the crowns of the bigger trees. That's something that we can influence and the corrections to that vector going forward live there. Mm -hmm. At the same time, we're influencing um, greenhouse gas emissions, driving them down, right? So, I, so go ahead. So uh, in, in driving those greenhouse gas emissions down is gonna take the better part of a century if we're really good at it right now. So this is a, this is a long term message. It's gonna take all of us. It's a big deal, and the climate is is uh, is a central actor, uh, and its change is a central actor in this story. So one of the things, um, and this is not in my notes here, but um, I'd like to ask you. Um, so after two thousand, I think um, we had several debates about uh, the nature of catastrophic wildfire, and I would say in quotes, right? And um, some people that I knew who are they're they're laymen, but they're very involved in forest issues. They think, well, there's no such thing as catastrophic wildfire. All wildfire is a part of the system. Um, but in the last 10 years, I've come to see that that there are instances of catastrophic wildfire where I have seen things that look as if they exploded and burned and changed, perhaps transmogrified perhaps forever. Um, yeah. so there is a difference between wildfire and catastrophic wildfire, is there? Yeah, I don't I don't use the term catastrophic because it means too many different things to different people. Um, I more like to think of it as when the wildfire is not characteristic for the forest type. Okay. When, it's, when it's out of bounds that way, when it's a lot more severe, where the amount of burned area is uncharacteristic, a lot more dead trees, then you know there's something important about the structure of that uh, forest condition that led to more extreme fire behavior. And, and so extreme fire behavior for the, the forest types is really the, is the topic at hand, right? If you're in dry open pine forests, you're going to get low severity fire because open pine forest begets low severity fire. If you're in moderate density sort of uh, large forests that used to have, you know, fires every 25 to 40 years, 
you're going to get quite a bit of low, but moderate severity as well in those. And that moderate severity it, at that same frequency begets more moderate frequency. Okay, so you're setting up a rhythm in those forest types. When you decline to set that rhythm up, what you end is building towards an extreme fire behavior that's not characteristic for that system. And so, so catastrophic fire paints it very value laden when in fact some wildfires have really good parts in them. Um, if I were, I've gone through most of the, the uh, burn severity data in the West over the last 20 years, actually since 1985, and I would say that I've pawed through lots of big fires where 30 to 50% uh, did a pretty good job. It's the other 50% on two or three really bad burn days that kicked our butt. And we, we didn't want that fire severity. It's uncharacteristic. It, it was extreme for the forest type. And I think that grounds it in the ecology, and that ecology connects to why you get aberrant behavior. Gotcha. And, yeah. um, can it burn? Yeah to actually damage the soul and its and its long-term productivity you know it does it really yeah. does um in a number of types where the severity so so uh soil severity we've got uh, severity with respect to tree mortality and then we have soil severity as well and soil severity is driven by an, a tremendous amount of energy release from the fire for a sustained period of time right so it means burned a long time, it was really hot, and it was that way for too long. What happens is it'll burn the duff and litter, and that smoldering consumption that goes on for weeks is where all the bad emissions that affect human health, but even more, the big logs that normally don't ignite in a more characteristic fire regime, they also ignite and they'll smolder for weeks to months. So you get five times the emissions you'd get out of a solar pres prescribed burn in that particular type and what happens is when that duff and litter burn super hot and they really ash out the soil you end up getting hydrophobic soils water repellent soils and that leads to you know, rain events where the water collects and runs over the soil surface you get erosion events you get debris torrents you get uh landslides things like that that happen that um are more current or more frequent, and they can be really damaging post-fire consequences, right? So hydrophobic soils in the native fire regime were much less common. So that 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 has to be avoided if human beings possibly can avoid it. I mean, I mean, hydrophobic soils over millions of acres of the Western Rockies is just not a positive in anybody's book. Well, you know, we've got we've got people hanging out in the interface and, and folks living in different forest types as well. And can you imagine with that wildland urban interface area that we have right now, it's growing fast. Can you imagine how some of these fires, even if they're stopped before they get to that rural or urban environment, how these big soil loss events can also affect them. Think of the metropolitan water supplies, you know, Bull Run watershed in the Cascades in the Portland uh, Portland, Oregon water supply, um, Cedar Creek, and some of the rivers of the West Cascades, and how they provide water for King County in Seattle. Yeah. So you've got you've got remote fire impacts, uh, tremendously influential to critical infrastructure. And it costs billions of dollars to to make it ready for full service again, right? So. Uh, so there's some really big ramifications of not only the fires, but the stuff that comes after the fires, right? Sure. Um, I think this is a good place to, to maybe talk about solutions, um, reintroducing fire to the landscape. And um, we'll talk about how that influences wildlife and wildlife management and hunting and fishing later. But like, what are some of the solutions? Some of the solutions are to use a really broad toolkit and match the tools to the circumstances. In uh, in back country where we don't have roads, where we're in national parks, we're in uh, roadless areas, where we're in wild wilderness areas, using managed wildfire uh, is a really good move. And if you stop, if you've fought wildfire before, your overhead team, um, when, when they're assigned to a fire project they don't have the landscape often prepared in front of them so that they can use fire as a tool. Like I said to you before, herding fire, uh, if, if uh, let's say you're a, 
uh, division two and and you've got one set of crews that you're lining out to be able to uh, influence somehow some part of a flanking fire, if they had anchor points pre-established on the landscape and control points where they can hook, hold, turn a wildfire, now you can turn a wildfire ignition into a management opportunity. And if you can hold the wildfire, you can say, I'm going to not let that fire burn for two or three days. I looked at the meteorology and that'd be a bad blunder. But then I got three or four days after that and I'm going to release that fire. And I've already got my trigger points set up and other control points downstream where I can essentially get pretty good or better fire behavior out of that fire. Managed wildfire is a critical tool and we have more opportunities to use it during modern fire weather. Uh, sometimes we can use prescribed burning. The fuels aren't aren't so bad that we can't, uh, in the spring and in the fall, walk in there with a drip torch and start knocking holes in it and, and knocking those fuel ladders down. And then a third tool that's really important is thinning before you do prescribed burning. And that's really suggested where there's so much tree development and so much fuel ladder development that even the handiest crews can't punch holes in that intelligently and maintain control. That is meat prescription with their prescribed burn, right? And meeting prescription really means something to a burn boss and a lighting boss and a holding boss, okay? Can you define that term, please? Uh, a, uh, a, pres a prescribed burning prescription? Prescribed burning or meeting prescription. Yeah, so a prescription is, is having a clear premeditated set of outcomes that you're shooting for, factoring in sure knowledge of the fuel conditions over the area that you intend to burn, clear knowledge of how much heat you can put into it because you know what the meteorological conditions are today and during the period of burning, and a clear understanding that those meteorological conditions you can count on so that you'll have the right fuel moisture, the right fire rate of spread, um, you'll control the burn because the the uh, thousand hour and ten thousand hour fuels, the bigger stuff, isn't curing out, so it's not going to ignite. So essentially, you're going to burn the quarter inch, one inch, three four inch stuff, but not the big the kindle, right? Yeah. And the prescribed burn burns the kindling, so it's much tougher to get the big wood burning. Yeah. So uh, a skilled prescribed burner is taking into account all those conditions in order to be able to execute, and they literally write a prescription. They have clear expectations in mind, and then they light it, they produce the right amount of heat energy, and they move it, and they respond to it with hose lays and and uh, sometimes additional back burning, that sort of thing, in order to be able to get that level of control that they want. So prescribed burning is a sophisticated tool, and we have a lot of really well-educated and highly skilled burners in this country, but we're still doing it way too little, and we have tremendous opportunity to deploy that tool on a bigger scale. Not your and, uh, and there's in terms of thinning and burning, the acreage that requires thinning and burning is a, is a large acreage west wide. It's yeah. non-trivial. It's because the conditions are bigger than you can simply address with a drip torch or a managed wildfire. Right. And um, is it so big? Do you, do you? <laughs> this is a bad, a bad question. But, uh, is it so big that you feel like we can do it, or um, would this have to be sort of a Manhattan Project level um, emphasis? It's a big, it's a big project, but I, uh, it might, I'm, I'm a history buff, and my read of history tells me we've risen to the occasion many, many times. I'm thinking of Roosevelt uh, telling the country that we're going to build 50,000 planes, and we amassed such a, a, an undertaking that we blew through 50,000 planes and built 100,000 of them for the war effort because we had all hands on deck and we focused our energy there. I think if we have a will to do it, I'm optimistic that we can pull it off, but it's got to be a fairly big move and at a large spatial scale to be able to change the way wildfires are burning the landscape. Does that mean right now we treat about 1% of the landscape in the West with our, our treatments and these are skilled treatments, but on average, our wildfires aren't finding the treatments because their scale and scope is not big enough. Uh, so tripling or quadrupling that annually allows us to be able to get our arms around the, the problem in 20 years and then we rinse and repeat. Yeah. I mean, it seems this is a place for renaissance and a lot of service as well. I mean, like a, this, this is the mission. Um, if fire suppression was the mission in post-1910, I mean, this is the mission. We've, it's our 
pretty much in front of us. I was reading a New York Times piece the other day um, where they were talking about the true threat if we don't figure this out. The true threat to to both economies. Like we're talking about infrastructure, urban interface. Um, that we're we're really just seeing the edge of it because the, the edge of, the age of megafire is upon us. We're in it. It is as uh, as Steve Pine said. Uh, we're in the piracy. We're smack dab in this era, and I'm sad to say that the best years uh, in this era are already behind us. Could you explain? It's a, more area is going to burn over over each consecutive decade, and uh, with the warming and drying and the increasing wind, they now are showing that we're having much more high wind events during specific burn trends of our fires, and so we can expect windier conditions um, to prevail. So it's not getting any better. It's not going to subside. Uh, We've had some horrific events in California, but they haven't seen their most horrific events yet in terms of life loss, structures lost, the whole thing. Uh, and so there's a lot of players that are working hard on the scene, insurance and reinsurance companies, uh, first responders, all sorts of uh, state and fed and private fire crews uh, are marshaling resources. Uh, but it, there's, a, there's a real need to to really increase our impact on the proactive side uh, to complement the reactive component. And I would argue it's probably bigger uh, in scale than uh, the, the support we provide to the whole suppression enterprise by quite some. Gotcha. Um, are, are you confident that this is one? I'm sorry? Are you confident that this, like you have a vision of how this could actually be, be done? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, it, it, it's it's something. Uh, so the the decisions, the policies, and the budgeting to do this is really out of my area. But I think a really important public debate needs to happen fairly soon at at numerous levels to clearly discuss the trade offs and to clearly know the citizens' minds uh, on what needs to happen and what they'll fully support. Right now, as you know, we're at odds across this country. We might be more polarized than we've been in a long time, but it's something we have to pull together. And I think it's easier to agree on something like this than perhaps a lot of other issues. Um, but there are key conversations that need to come about that are also not in my bailiwick. Um, every time you do prescribed burning, you make smoke. And smoke is a huge human health concern right now. And there's tremendous smoke fatigue in the West from all the wildfires burning. And so the question is, how is you gonna make more? Well, the only way to buy down the wildfire smoke is to make better smoke with prescribed burning, uh, which is a lot lesser smoke. Those trade-off analyses have been done in a lot of places, but still that human health and uh, smoke and uh, prescribed burning conversation needs to be concluded. It, they need to sort it. Um, and there's a lot of other things that, that are sort of negative cascades that come out of doing positive work. And those are social discussions that policymakers and lawmakers need to chase into a corner and be clear about what their tactics are, are going to be when they fully understand the issues. And, and that, that involves us having uncomfortable conversations, you know, in, in rooms full of people who disagree and understand that that conflict is going to be um, exhausting, but necessary. I think that's right. One of the reasons I conclude my TED talk with the question for citizens is how do you want your fire and how do you want your smoke? Gotcha. No fire and no smoke options aren't on the table. So the question really is the pregnant question. If you're going to get fire and right now it's wildfire because the Western landscape is being burned by the two or three percent of escape wildfires that occur in each year, right? So we know that result and we know it's escalating. So the question is, can we do better than that? Can we produce less smoke and better fire behavior? And the answer is, you damn betcha. Okay, and, and so the, the core question is, can we do it at a sufficient scale 
and rapidly enough to be able to turn the tide of events. And that again is a policymaker and uh, a lawmaker sort of decision. And I think as citizens, we can work with them at all levels to let them know that this is something we really care deeply about. And we would love it if they would take a very active hand and active role in this. And they be in the citizenry. The citizen, yeah. back hunters and anglers yeah. working local to uh, their local state and federal representatives and uh, and uh, senators to be able to let them know that this is you know three kind of thing um, because okay. it's really changing our quality of life you know yeah for the better so it, Paul so can we integrate this is a question that I'm sure that people are listening to this are coming up with because it's in foremost in my mind as we discuss huge landscape scale um, operations to, to reduce fuel loads. Can is can this be integrated with positive and active wildlife management? Are there going to be costs there? Or are there going to be advantages, positives, negative? So, so stop and think about when you when you undergo a long period of fire exclusion. As you develop more uh, complexly layered, uh, denser forests, you have some winners and some losers in that, right? And so some species have benefited pretty significantly. Well, species like white-headed woodpecker and a number of woodpeckers have actually not benefited. Imagine the Western woodpeckers and sapsuckers, for example, if they had this flow of small to medium-sized patches of wildfires, happening but the right kind of fires they'd always be able to have habitat uh nesting roosting and foraging habitat conditions that really made sense so there's going to end up being some uh reductions of of conditions where uh species that that like uh dense dark uh, layered forests uh and those have increased tremendously where they they're growing on sites where they can't be maintained you'll have to change who makes a living there in terms of species. But I think that we have analytical tools right now that will allow us to be able to make those transitions smartly. So we're always leaving places for each of those species to hang out over time. But the, the, the possibility of changing the landscape in small incremental steps isn't gonna be available to us. I think the game is gonna be over in the West in the next 20 years. Uh, and, and we're seeing with area burn predictions, even the most conservative ones, uh, we're gonna see tremendous losses to habitat. So I think uh, increasing the scale of these activities and the pace of them and doing them well will benefit not only forest for the future, but also a greater variety of forest conditions. Um, in some of those panoramas that you saw on the TED Talk, I'm showing how all the native species in those panoramas emerged and evolved and made it to the present day in landscapes that weren't all dense forests. They were massive areas of grassland and shrubland and sparse woodland and savanna and crumholtz on that landscape. The, uh, the dry forests were 30 to 40% non-forests. That means in areas that could readily support trees that push pull between factors growing forests and disturbances taking them away eliminated naturally 30, 40, in some places, 50% of forest cover. And those were the grasses and shrublands and meadows, wet and dry and so forth on the landscape, key landscape elements for critters. And the grain of that landscape was in tens to hundreds of acres. And so stuff was really local nearby if you needed a salad bowl of varied habitat conditions, right? Now you look across big landscapes and you see vast areas with dense trees and it all looks alike. That's what those photos really show. And part of the take home is that patchwork supported the native species very successfully over space and time. We already know that. They came to the present era through those conditions. Thank you. And I know while, while we're here on this, um, we all kind of live through the beetle kill even in Montana, especially down to Wyoming. Wyoming is now going through a spruce budworm kill in the Shoshone National Forest. Right. So those events are related to, to the lack of fire as well, or, or are they? They really are. Um, the insect outbreaks are really, really kind of an interesting story in themselves. 
Um, I, I have maps that I show of what the budworm susceptibility of an historical landscape might have looked like. And what you see is there's patches here and there that were very, very vulnerable to budworm. But the cool thing that happened is that the next door patch was either of another species or it was not, uh, it didn't have the structure, the layered structure to support budworm larvae spinning down from tree to tree to tree and completing their maturation. So you'd have a tree, uh, a patch get defoliated, or maybe two, and then the outbreak would die off because they didn't have uh, close patches close at hand to disperse to. Same thing with bark beetles. Bark beetles have an obligatory flight period where they fly you know, a kilometer or more to complete their maturation. And within that flight, they're trying to find a susceptible stand to get to. Well, if you look at the patchwork, very often they, during dispersal, they got lost because they didn't find a patch with suitable habitat and they just clobbered the one they came out of. And so you'd see dispersal losses were very big number as a consequence. So the patchwork supported um, those disturbances happening in an ecologically sound way now and again. Well, I mean, that's so obvious to me with the lodgepole, oh. with the pine beetle yeah. lodgepole, you know. Um, you had used a term earlier um, called fire flow. You know how fl fire flows like like current through the thing, and um, disease events and and um, insect infestations. And as you break those, you reduce their intensity. Absolutely. The it, it, this goes back to my my first story about how I moved sideways into landscape ecology because I saw that these critters. And these processes read the landscape like a novel, right? They basically say, oh, there's a host over there, I'll go over there. But if you had this patchwork that those host conditions were interrupted and so the native insects and pathogens were serving a positive ecological role, creating um, top kill, you know? And that might be a place for a sap sucker to bang a hole in and build a cavity because now it's got a dead top. And in a recent study, we found out about 50% of the cavity excavating birds we studied, which were woodpeckers and sapsuckers, they made their nest in a cavity on a tree that was partly dead only. It had scaffolding live foliage on it. And so we now have this sense that these kinds of events that create mortality scattered hither and yon throughout the forest are also providing habitat. Uh, also, and so our sense of the native pathogens and insects, they weren't a runaway train historically, they were doing good work. Yeah. And they've been doing it a long time. When I think about yeah. the cultural burning that you're talking about, um, it kind of gives me optimism um, because at the moment it feels like that Homo sapiens has sort of mismanaged the landscape to the point where we've actually imperiled our own survival, you know. But, but we actually have a longer track record of not doing that. Right. You know, uh, I, when I, when I, uh, we're working pretty closely with a number of Western tribes right now, and it is a rare treat. It's really an honor. Um, I tell my wife every once in a while, you know, I'm pretty convinced this tribe has forgotten more than we know about how to use wildfire, that the exquisite knowledge and the stories they can tell you about how they burned to control pests on acres, on acorns, um, uh, how they maintained uh, the Willamette Valley. If you've ever driven through the Willamette Valley, if you go high into the foothills of the Cascades, you will see Oregon white oak woodlands going 10, 12, 15 miles away from the current valley floor where you can see the oaks and the grassland. The Willamette and Sletz Indians were burning that area and they drove and created a much larger acorn uh, harvest area well into the site one and site two Douglas fir zone. And they maintained that with fire and burning and they collected and created these open savannas, which could produce uh, in a hundred years, 50, 40, 50 inch diameter Douglas fir. Wow. So, so they cultivated the landscape for food production and what I'm learning from the Karuk Indians right now in Northern California is that they did things like burn during the inversions. You've been in that Klamath country when they get their inversions. Well, they would burn during those inversions and create cloud cover with smoke in order to be able to keep the temperatures in the Klamath River wow. uh, 
cooler so the salmon would hang out longer and their harvest period was longer. And that would be measured in weeks difference. And they use smoke to do that. Um, wow. Just just exquisite use of fire as a technology, if you will. Yeah. Um, uh, it's. I wish I'd started working with these folks much earlier because it's blowing my head up. It's it's wonderful stuff. Yeah, there's some kind of a deep knowledge there now um, that I, well, I, I think that's our future actually. Is is I mean we've tried the ham-handed approach. Yeah. The, uh, I was writing a paper recently with a, a Kruk Indian who's also an ecologist with the Pacific Southwest Research Station, a marvelous man. His name is Frank. And he turned on to this idea that there was an intergenerational relationship to the land. And I said, what does that mean practically? And he said that uh, we manage the land for the production of of first foods and medicines and things like that off the landscape. And we consider it a human service to the ecosystem so that we we are starting and maintaining something that has been going on for centuries before us. And when we deliver this landscape, when we pass from the landscape, it is it is working right for the next generation that comes on, learns fire, continues to apply it, continues to uh, manage the berry fields. They call it, it's not an ecosystem service for people. It's a human service to the ecosystem, a multi-generational cross-cultural uh, way of thinking about how we're doing good work for generations. <laughs> so um, I uh, wish we were actually ending on that note, but I wanted, I want to do something a little bit, a little more mundane and a lot less exciting, but might be integral to this idea. And one of those is um, whether you, you had a wonderful answer to me about the, the use of lawsuits by sort of environmental groups or, or, or any group um, to say stop thinning projects and how as we move into this landscape scale um, fuels reduction, management, we're going to face, we're going to face some lawsuits from well-meaning people um mm -hmm. you had a great thing about not that some of these lawsuits we, we want to keep this ability to do this because you want to hold people accountable and yet how are we going to navigate that we uh so so being being held in check to to do good due diligence and do good work is a really important thing. You know, these are public trust lands, 190 million acres of them, and we should do a first class job. And when we're not, we should be held accountable. Um, in addition to that, um, we're seeing in a lot of quarters, not just forestry and wildfire management, but we're seeing frivolous lawsuits. And so the question is, can we come together and put the best science to bear so that we can clearly understand the causes and consequences and then sift through those filings, those lawsuits that are more frivolous and call them what they are. There's a there's a bit of pseudoscience going on out there right now to sort of muddy the water. And we have some sense that muddying the water is the game. It's throwing sand in the gears. And uh, an awful lot of it stems from, um, I think, mistrust. Uh, I think uh, large trees, old forests became iconic. And when people saw them going down the road on log trucks, a lot of the folks that saw that and got burned up about, they're still alive. And uh, so there's a mistrust sometimes that agency actions aren't always going to go the way they should. And so it's, it's important that we have our feet held to the fire. But I also think it's important we pay attention when the the feet to the fire is a frivolity and it it does not represent the best knowledge and so there's going to be this this push pull that needs to be there but we need to navigate it a lot more elegantly than we are right now we're we're being litigated into inaction right now and i think that's a serious harm to the western landscape yeah and um that's actually a uh, that's a great answer and i i just i've often talked to people about this you know where i live in rural Montana mostly, and people are always, they think that the environmentalists have, have killed everything and stopped all every action. 
And in some cases, that's true, you know. And um, but I often say to them, I, I say, well, I don't really want to throw that particular baby out with that particular bath water either, and and to then th throw out the accountability, you know, of the public and its involvement with its own land. Um, Absolutely. I, I have to tell you that um, I've worked closely with environmental lawyers and uh, leads in the Nature Conservancy, the Wilderness Society, uh, conservation groups that really want to solve the riddle and they want to do it well. And I have to tell you that uh, there's a ton of well-meaning, well-acting people in those organizations and and they're pulling for the good stuff. They just want us to be serious and deliberate and reduce the downsides as much as possible. Um, but that's not everybody. There are, there are folks who have other intentions than that as well. And so I think you're right. I think the feed you have is really important. Uh, throwing that baby out with the bathwater, uh, getting rid of ESA or getting rid of NEPA, those are, those are serious uh, wrongs in my opinion. We should be held to a good NEPA process, just not prolonged. And there's Endangered Species Act for a very good reason. There's a lot of critters that we care a great deal about that are on the on the ropes right now, and we should do our best to get them back off the ropes. So, you know. Yeah. Well, I think I think if, if people were listening to this, you go back to where you were explaining the, the, the true nature of, of a healthy, functioning, fire-dependent landscape. I mean, there's winners and losers in that landscape. I, I think in one of your talks, you talked about managing for the spotted owl until you create, which is an old until you create this enormous monoculture that then explodes and you don't have a forest or an owl. Yeah, the uh, the spotted owl needs to persist on this landscape, east side and west side. In my part of the world, fire exclusion has created a ton of spotted owl habitat. And uh, the West Slope and the coast ranges were harvested. Oh, just 90% of the forests were removed through timber harvest. And so spotted owls are in a really tough spot right now. And uh, they're trying to buy them hang time on the east side. But it's really a tough sell because we can't keep fire out of a lot of those woods right now. And so we need to be able to have some sort of a middle ground where we can start to create more typical conditions surrounding the best habitats. So we actually have an opportunity to buy time on the east side. And uh, uh, as you know, in Eastern Oregon, in the Klamath country, we've lost a lot of spotted owl habitat because of these, these very large areas that are super vulnerable to severe fire. And you get a couple of bad days and they go up very fast. You know, the biscuit fire is a great example, the B and B fire and, in uh, Central Oregon on these sides, another great example. Um, I think we could do better, and I think we should. Yeah. Well, um, Paul, I want to. I think that's given us a lot to think about, and I want to leave some time for people to ask their questions. But um, I was going to ask you. Last time I talked with you, you were blocking out some hunting time um, when we were trying to set this up. Um, did you Did you get out amongst them this year? I didn't. We had a COVID complication and we had to shut it down. Wow. Yeah. I think you got the company there. Yeah. Got it. Had a COVID complication. Um, I came home and uh, got online, though, and got my tagging license for Idaho Whitetail uh, for next year. So, gotcha. yeah, it's a it's a it's a gorgeous hunt and limited tags. And so I got in the queue right away. <laughs> but, uh, of, of all the places that you've seen in um, in your travels doing the, your ecological research, um, do you have a favorite part of the West? Oh, man, it's really hard, isn't it? Yeah. To, to choose. I probably I probably spent the most uh, most nights sleeping on the ground in wilderness areas um, on doing horseback research and uh, or uh, river raft and not research off a river raft. Well, uh, so wilderness areas are are my very favorite because they're the best classroom. The Frank Church is is amazing. You spent time there. Um, the Selwy Bitterit is it's like nothing else, and it's it's the hardest country I've ever worked in. Um, it just beats you to death because those it's rocky, craggy, and steep and 
the trails are either right up the cow's face or they're in the draws and um but it's drop dead gorgeous and then the bob marshall i i think i want to be buried there we've spent a lot of time for the last 30 years in the bob and uh you can't get enough yeah 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 i got you I, all three of those are top on my list as well i was i was telling you earlier that when that selway country when you drop off say off the top of the bitter roots uh, it's so low elevation yeah it's it's more really benevolent down in that bottom than than most parts of the mountain west. Mm -hmm. There's all that berries and there's all that clear cold water. That White Cap Creek you're talking about, right? Um, that that creek I was I saw that before it burned. Um, and White Cap Creek was a big cutthroat. I'm sure there's still cutthroats in it, um, but that was hit pretty hard with fire, wasn't it? Yeah. Well, the uh, the white cap. You're still talking about the white cap, right? Yes. The white the white cap drainage is one of the very first wildernesses in the early '70s where we allowed uh, fires to burn under uh, more typical conditions. And so our studies there have been basically to ask the question: 50 years later, what do we get? How do we do? Uh, can so, you see what you found? Um, it's been a really good thing to let fires burn. Uh, the the uh, hydrologic benefits are significant. Um, the uh, the severity of fires that are happening in the Selway now are uh, are more toned down. So you'll see big areas burned, but not a lot of tree loss. Um, like we were talking about before. Um, the western red cedar on a lot of our river bottoms, including the Selway, the, the mortality. Yeah. Um, we're seeing that in the Selway and other uh, major trips that we um, whitewater raft down, right? Uh, a lot of times the red cedar on those bottoms. And we're seeing dieback and then mortality events happening right now. And my, my suspicion is that what allowed them to be great habitats when they established 100 or two or 300 years ago, they're different habitats and they're having a hard time making a living now. So I think we're witnessing some climate warming local effects right. in these areas. Um, I, uh, I had a 15, 15 foot diameter oak in my yard that I cut down this year and uh, it was just massive. Cut it down because warming in the last five or ten years has been making it impossible for water to get up to the top of my tree. And so you can imagine that the branches that are on the inside don't have lateral branches, they just have on top. And so it's hardest to get water up there in the hot, dry, windy days are um, causing the water column to break to those branches. And I had three branches die two years ago. They were they were as big as trees. They were probably branches that were three feet in diameter where they joined the major tree and, or larger. And, and then the next more branches died out and it was just they couldn't get water on those hot, dry days and the water column broke. And I'm seeing effects of that all over the place now in areas that have been there long enough to see the change, right? So um, to me, the fire ecology is getting better in the cellway and it's better set up for climate change but I'm worried about some other and unanticipated effects that we're just not thinking about, you know? Yeah. That we don't know yet. I lost him there for a minute, Sawyer. I don't know if there's... Uh, is he still on your screen? Yep. But it's frozen. Yeah, I see it on my end, too. Let's see if we can bring it back in the middle. <laughs> there you go. What's that? Uh, I lost you for a minute. Um, what I, I think, Paul, if you don't mind, we'll pull a few questions. If somebody wants to write in, I can see the chat side. That'd be super fun. Let's do it. Okay. I'm bringing my technician on. <laughs> um, so my first question here is, 
are there any good studies or meta studies looking at carbon emissions for prescribed fire followed by transitioning to natural quote unquote fire behavior over a longer term versus the current patterns where we had built up and I've got to move it down a little bit. Um, versus the current patterns where we built up fuel loads, unnatural plant diversity, et cetera, and then go into mega fires. So I, I think the question is asking is, is there a, is there a study, but of the emissions from control burns versus risking the eventual inevitable mega fire? That's a really smart question. We're, uh, we're actually working on a project right now, um, uh, burning under prescribed burning conditions. So at prescription under moderate fire weather, and then under typical escape wildfire scenarios, um, patches on about uh, 7 million sampled acres in 450 watersheds of four states. And what we're finding out is the emissions you can save are tremendous. You can reduce emissions by half to 90% um, by applying prescribed burning to those fuel beds versus a wildfire under the typical escape condition. Me Good deal. So uh, the other question was, um, by reducing fuel, do you mean more applied fire or more harvest? How does this fuels impact uh, greenhouse gas emissions? Aren't we removing carbon as we as we reduce as we do say mechanical harvesting? That's another super smart question. So this is a big dilemma right now. Um, a lot of people are saying plant more trees. That's how you fix the carbon problem. Um, but the problem is on the landscape, too many trees and in and too dense formulations. And so what wildfires are doing is they're backing off density and forested area until there's a more of a better balance between the factors growing trees and taking them away. Uh, that's why we look at the historical landscapes to ask that question, right? And so uh, we're talking about doing um, managed wildfire and prescribed burning where, where that's the tool that we can manage. Um, where we can't do that, and it's going to require thinning to predate the prescribed burning so we can actually meet prescription with the follow-up burn treatments, then that's going to be the choice. So it's matching the tool to the conditions that is the key. And if we do that, we will save a ton of smoke. Uh, on the carbon question, we're growing carbon that we can't sustain on the landscape. And uh, I've got a grant with a colleague in uh, British Columbia right now. We're actually at a, the whole BC province asking the question, what is sustainable carbon storage? And I'm willing to bet it's going to be a fraction of what's growing in BC right now. Um, because uh, I don't know if you followed uh, 2017 and 18 fire years, but their fires were so big and so hot and so smoky that their emissions tripled emissions from all other sectors. So, so forest fires became a doubler or a tripler to fossil fuel emissions. Wow. So, so this is going to be is the answer to store more carbon. Okay. Um, and this is something I, I appreciate because I had to thought myself. Um, is there interest from FEMA insurance companies, and that's the question is, et cetera, to encourage these prescription burns, are, are they offering funding? Are they lobbying? Are they offering political support? Are they coming to, the, to politicians and, and asking for this to happen? Are you seeing those sectors speaking up? There are. There's a lot of tools developing right now relative to the insurance industry and the reassurance industry, the folks who insure insurance companies. Um, I've spoken at a number of conferences, insurance companies, and one of the things they're saying right now is if in the 21st century we don't get a handle on wildfires in a big way, getting homeowners insurance in fire prone areas will be a thing of the past. So they're working really hard to be able to do that. Really well to do families and ranchettes. Um, insurance companies are hiring fire crews at the outset of fire to be able to protect those houses as a, as a bet hedging strategy. But they're also working to uh, apply pressure on the insurance side to create incentives like uh, rating different 
houses and landscapes for their preparedness. And if you get this work done to firewise your place, you know, harden your home, harden your landscape, then your rate can get down to a more normal rate again. So, so they're doing quite a few things. And I don't think we've uh, seen that industry produce the full tool set that they're capable of. I think, I think the insurance company is going to play a huge role in getting us to behave better with wildfire. Gotcha. Great answer. Um, and any other questions? Uh, uh, how would you, or I would ask, could you improve timber harvest schedules to better replicate natural fire regimes? Uh, that's a great question. The the fire return interval from many natural regimes is um, in the dry forest. It's a it's a frequent interval, and so the answer would be. It's easier there in the dry and the moist mixed conifer to say yes. In the colder forest conditions, a lot of those are roadless. They're not operable. Uh, there's still quite a bit of resistance to go up and get into the lodgepole and some and fir and spruce and create the patchwork that needs to happen there. Um, but I'd say it's going to be yes and no uh, over the long haul that, uh, that people are going to have uh, they're going to sort of have uh, areas that they work along a schedule and they'll look at the timing over big space to determine what their scheduling was. Um, there's a, one, uh, is there, a, it's, the question is how can we best approach private timber companies and family foresters to help encourage prescribed burns? Um, is that already underway? Um, Private timber companies, especially the, the industrial um, private landholders, that's a tough sell. Uh, the non-industrial people, uh, the Forest Service and the states have expanded the good neighbor authorities so that projects can now, uh, by adjacency, can include private lands. And so if you can get five, 10 landowners, some of which are adjacent to state or federal land, you can be pulled into a project and the analysis and the skills that are associated with implementation of that project. But I think right now, um, an awful lot of that development is sort of in a beginning, you know, second or third inning kind of stage right now as people scratch their heads and figure what are all the things that we can do to bust a significant move and across all ownerships, right? Sure. Okay. Um, and then I, I'm going to probably well, let's see. Well, I, I've got one extra here, but um, how, it says how much would it cost? So I'm, not, I'm sure we don't really know that. But I think it's a, uh, I'm going to rephrase this question a little bit. I, I'm hoping I, that's OK. But uh, is, it, is it achievable to bend the curve on insect and disease infestation to reduce these stand replacement fires? Um, or would that be a waste of resources is, is the question. Um, and I think I think we talked. I think it is achievable to do that. Right. It is achievable if you rebuild the patchworks that are more typical for the forest types, you're gonna find that uh, big insect outbreaks don't have the run of the show. You're gonna see outbreaks be smaller, and more uh, less frequent, less chronic as a consequence. So that will be really helpful. I, I really believe the magic is in restoring more highly functional patchworks to A, get back better head, habitat networking and increase the reliability of knowing what the severity of the next fire is gonna be. Gotcha. Um, this is a humdinger of a question and I'm gonna, I'm gonna let this one be the last one. <laughs> um, I'm really grateful for the ways you draw on the wisdom of historic indigenous practices of landscape management. Those practices developed alongside the native landscape. How are those practices impacted by the massive amount of invasive species that have been introduced to the continent, both established tree and shrub species and disease causing insects, as we talked about blister rust, that can devastate native landscapes such as the emerald ash borer here in Michigan? Yeah, that's a mouthful, Jeff. <laughs> um, so the... Uh, the the introduced pathogens and insects is a real problem because the the natural enemies of those pathogens and insects were not likewise introduced and so you see a lot of work in laboratories especially with the emerald ash borer that you spoke of where they're trying to develop a biological means of being able to sort of rebuild the, the 
the predators and enemies of emerald ash border to bring that more to heel. But the fact that we're introducing trees and shrubs and uh, noxious herbs and grasses is a non-trivial thing. We have a lot of them that are here to stay and our, our uh, successes with curbing expansion uh, are really limited, especially with things like cheatgrass and bentonata and um, a number of things like medusa, medusa head. Um, uh, so I think the strategies are going to continue the way they are to bring in the pathogens and the predators of these kinds of things, you know, biocontrol for cheatgrass, things like that. Uh, and we need to invest more of it. But I think one of the key things is is to do our best to limit spread of invasives because it seems like we we that's the that's the greatest way to to curtail the problem is to not have ever expanding area of the problem and having expanding areas of several problems begin to overlap each other that feels like it's in the war so it seems curtailing spread and then putting significant energy into bringing back that entire community that can uh, wage natural battle with uh, these enemies and curtail their spread, making them more a part of the landscape rather than dominant in the landscape. Well, yeah, that, you know, <laughs> that was a masterful answer to the hard question. <laughs> so, Paul, yeah. uh, if, unless you have anything, final fantastic wisdom to fall upon us, um, I'll, call, I'll call it a night. Yeah, it's uh, it's been super fun hanging out with you and uh, doing this. I hope uh, I hope we provided something useful for the folks listening in. Uh, it was fun doing it, and maybe we can do it again. I hope so. I'm I'm super glad to be connected to the wisdom you got. I'm uh, I learned so much from our exchange. I was I was those were all those questions were questions I wanted really wanted the answer to. And um, when I opened up that email, I was, I was, I was like, yes. <laughs> so, yeah. well, this was fun. Thanks for, thanks for uh, having me on. And uh, I hope it was good for the folks listening in. Yeah. Thanks again, Dr. Paul Hesburgh. Thanks everybody for being here. Good night. We'll talk down the road.